everyone. Welcome back to the Mogabar Show. My name is Gabe. As always, with me, I have Nikhil. And we are going to have a great talk today about startups, tech, and basically everything. Nikhil, welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Sure, sure. Uh, hey, everybody. Honored to be on the show. Thanks for having me, Gabe. Um, I am currently the co-founder of Head Up and Head of Operations at a company called Chat Mode, doing things in the um, enterprise space around technology, innovation, and other cool stuff. So AI, digital humans, we're doing a lot. We're doing a lot of cool things these days. But I've actually been in the startup and texting for about 10 years now. Everything from uh, being a speaker, I was a web developer in the past. Now I do more like operational and product stuff. I do some angel investing on the side. And uh, yeah, pretty frequent actually startup advisor. I, I'm very passionate about the space. I'm very passionate about working in technology and, and pushing it to its limits. And yeah, I guess I guess my recent thing I should mention for you know the listeners out there is that I'm getting really into Web three. So I think and I I think everyone sort of is, but I've I've been diving down pretty hard, and I'll actually be you know trying to trying to be a part of some events coming up at least locally where I am right now uh, around that space and and seeing what happens there because there's a ton of opportunity. But yeah, otherwise I'm always on the bleeding edge. So in some nice. one way or another. No. Nice. Let, let's let, let's start with what, uh, the last thing you mentioned first. Let's talk. Yeah. Let's talk about Web three for a second. Let's dive into that. Let's do it. Maybe not everyone knows what Web three is. I, I'm not going to claim to be completely knowledgeable. I know sure. basics, but for those that don't know what Web three, give us just you know a layman's breakdown of Web three. Yeah. So for Web three, I would say you know it's a it's beyond a, a new strategy of technology. It's really a new way of thinking, right? The internet, we've gotten to this point where the idea of decentralization and privacy are a lot more popular because, you know, we have big companies who are, you know, who own you know, large parts of the internet and data sources and your data and your, your family's data and everything, you know, everything around the sun these days, right? And the idea of Web3 is approaching things from a new angle of, you know, maybe more democratized ownership, uh, you know, secure ways to own something that's that's more encrypted, more intelligent, more personalized to you. And again, not something that is necessarily bought and sold through your data and in, in the way that you accomplish it or, or, or receive something. So I'm thinking like social tokens and NFTs, right? These are things, these are new ways of ownership and new ways of asset management, which is, you know, pretty much completely in your hands through, you buy them through platforms, but it's not really like you're, you're buying something that becomes someone else made and it becomes completely yours to franchise, to use. And I think a lot of Web3, even the, the platforms and the web applications and the metaverses are, that are being built are going to be ruled by their community, or not ruled, but you know managed and, and improved by their communities rather than, again, like a, a central party at the top. Maybe there's people developing it behind the scenes, but in terms of the way that it works, in terms of the utility that it has, that'll be more, more power to the people. And again, more decentralized and more secure and yeah, just just I think in general it, it presents new ideologies that that can help people understand the value of having their data a little more secured or having more ownership over assets that they have. Um, again, rather than having middlemen and and third parties and and uh, you know big corporations that have the full control over over the types of assets you own or or the things that you might uh, be trying to buy out there. And I think that would be I think there's a I think I'm just scraping the the you know like top of the iceberg here too because yeah. i think there is so much more you can get into as you talk to more technical people yeah, yeah. Uh, blockchain and crypto and all that kind of stuff too but i wanted to really zoom out because i think it's it's it'd be on it'd be wrong of me to just say that it's all about crypto or just about the metaverse it's about a, a like a mix of things that are all coming mm -hmm. together to fuel this new mindset and fuel this new um way of thinking about building technology and integrating things and infrastructure frankly to again more more decentralized but secure resources yeah i mean no that that's that's pretty that's pretty cool because i know that there there is like you said there's a lot that's happening with yeah. web3 defi mm -hmm. DAOs, depending on where you're going into but you know and not to put you on the spot but i i've had this yeah. conversations um with people and i'm probably the least qualified to have this conversation and i you know something about well you know there's rareable open c those are the top two nft platforms sure. which you know that's where people go to you know they pay their gas fees they do what they have to do. And they're like, well, is an open C and rareable web two platforms. And so you're essentially buying web three products on yeah. a web two platform. So isn't web two platform still the one that's above web three? I was like, oh, you got me. I was like, yeah, I don't yeah. know what to say. 
I, I don't, you know, these days, I don't really know what to say either, mostly because it's true, like even Coinbase, right, is fundamentally a Web2 company, Rarible, OpenSea. You know, I, I will say that like a pretty good, a pretty interesting example of a more uh, Web3 oriented thing is Decentraland, which is, mm-hmm. it is, it is owned by a company that does a lot of partnerships and integrates a lot of cool brands into the space. But fundamentally, I believe most of the most of the operating abilities and the way the world's developed in the in this virtual reality space and the token involved with it too is uh, all developed by a DAO and a community. So they're they're popping up. The true Web three companies are popping up in weird places. I could also argue that there's you know those companies that are building the infrastructure for what Rarible and OpenSea might be using in the back end to access blockchains or support new coins or whatever. Those companies are certainly probably more. They're a little little more stealth, but they're probably Web3, you know, very Web3 first oriented as well in the sense of how they're building and, and the type of technology they're using. But yes, fundamentally, the problem is right now is that there isn't a good way to distinguish the two because a lot of the companies that are doing it are either understated or they don't really need to be in the limelight. And what we have in the limelight are companies that are holding, like Coinbase in particular, are sort of holding a keys to the kingdom for bringing in the mainstream into Web3. And I think, you know, it's, it's maybe, I don't want to, you know, say that this is like an absolute truth or anything. But I think, unfortunately, we're going to have Web 2.5 sort of a little bit right now while the mainstream catches up yeah. due to the recent crypto crash, due to, you know, like NFTs jumping up and down and becoming very volatile and, and also all the hacks and, and wallet drains, right? So it's complex to say when that's going to end, but I will say that there is hope. It's just, there's a, there's a transition period that's going to happen first. And I think a lot of those companies that you're talking about will actually... I mean, I, I hope their snipers aren't, you know, anywhere too nearby, but I think they will be usurped. And I think there will be new companies that will provide a much, much finer detail of Web3 first thinking and Web3 first, you know, even even their investors will be more mm-hmm. Web3 oriented rather than Web2 people trying to get into Web3, right? And I'm bullish on, I'm bullish on sort of the, call it a new way of thinking, right? And, and how that's going to go. But I think it will require some things to be phased out before new ones can be phased in. And a transition period as well. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's sort of kind of like the standard, you know, when you see new technologies propping up, you know, normally it's like all guns blazing, then there's yeah. a little pushback and then there's like, mm, kind of, you know, and then it's like, you see it come up into what it's supposed to be, you mm-hmm. know, with time after it's had time yes. to mature. Yes. So I think that's sort of what's to be expected here. Now, sure. now let's pivot a little bit because you know, we talked about Web3, but also, mm-hmm. you know, you are very active in the startup community as an advisor, as an angel investor, mm-hmm. as a founder, um, and a leader. What is your favorite part about being in a startup? And, and actually, wait, let me rephrase that question a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. Um, go ahead. Because that because was sort of open-ended or, or really just open. But what's your f- favorite role to take Ooh. in a startup? Easy, man. It's product for me. So coming from the background that I, I'm from, which is like, I literally started as a front end web developer, I did a little bit of like, I used to work for some, um, you know, like, cool, like development shops and agencies. So I was not only I was doing like, customer facing stuff as an engineer who could actually like talk to clients and actually get them through and do customer support. So I, I was sort of in this like very interesting mesh of things back then. But really back then it was just a, I was just a developer with like a fancy, like I had a little bit more marketing and a little more communication skills than the average engineer. But okay. over time that has developed in what I believe. And there's also, there was, I also did project management back then because I had an agency as well of my own, but all those things sort of started meshing together and sort of bumping heads until, you know, product really blew up as a, as a role. Right. And so, you know, finally after engineering and sales, there was another role which had a lot of power and a lot of value and a lot of authority, but you know, it, it like, it, it just like blew up in the startup space and, and product was that. And it really, it's great, man. It's the ability to be able to, you know, interact with marketing one day, sales the other day and bring their things together to make better, yeah. you know, roadmaps, products, you know, optimizing different, different routes of how communication has to flow. And, you know, even, even, you know, often I have to like so designers, developers, bridging them with the right teams as well. Product lives in a very interesting intersection of a lot of those things and really helps guide the vision with like, you know, usually a, a C-suite or, or higher management level. And uh, yeah, man, that by far the whole the whole boom of the product trend has been uh, my favorite, you know, my favorite area to be a part of, but it certainly is 
consistently adapting and, and something I could talk about all day on that side as well. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's very innovative in its own way right now. And I'm excited for what the future of that looks like. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, yeah. what do you look for in a startup before you invest, before you advise, before you decide to consult in some capacity? What are you yeah. looking for? Whether it's in the founder, the product, mm -hmm. like what stands out? It's, it's got to be team, man. So I'm going to be completely honest with you that I think that, and I, I love, you know, I love a good product that has traction. I love a good pitch deck as much as anything. But fundamentally, I'm a very people-oriented person. I do uh, identify myself in sort of a more Gen Z category than millennials. So my, my thinking might be a little bit different. But you know, fundamentally, I love working with leaders who are really trying to, A, be themselves in the work that they do and the team that they lead you know, in, in a positive way, right? hopefully. And I think you know, in terms of it's, it's great to be a visionary. And it's great to have all these ideas, but if you can't lead a team, if you can't manage, if you can't communicate that vision appropriately and properly to optimize, to, to really build it out, you could, you could be making money initially, but that thing's going to fizzle out really fast, right? Or you might run into issues where, uh, you know, you have issues with, with churn, uh, you know, employee churn, or you might have issues where, you know, you can't quite like find product market fit, even if you have that initial funding, like these are all very serious problems that I think a lot of founders discount a little bit because they're just so excited to build, 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 which is fine. But then one day you're going to wake up and realize, like, where did everybody go? Where's where's the direction of all of this? Like, you know, it it can be very it can be very volatile. So personally, I really do look at the team. I really do look at the founders and how they're working on this. And I, I think product is is important at a balanced level as well. But I'm not going to lie in saying that the first thing that I look for is that conversation. It's not just like you know, I, I can't just be talking to a, a founder who like, you know, or, or, or generally a team, if I'm, if I'm meeting a bunch of people who just seem like they're really scattered and all over the place, even if they have a really baller product, you know, I do want to see, I like to see cohesion. I like to see people who are working symbiotically and, and not, you know, having like too many conflicts or too many like clashing visionaries. I think, I think that's an important thing. And I think as we, you know, a, a new generation of leaders is going to focus on that a lot more than even past leaders have, and even a new generation of investors too. So. I know it's cliche to say team, but I, I really do mean it. And I, I hope it. Not at all. I think the about mold. people, there's no product. So I, I really know. think so too. I really think so. No, too. That's awesome. I, no, that's a great answer. But I, I do want to sort of, um, because in, in case whoever's watching this, you're going to find out quickly that I don't have a structure to my, uh, to this talk. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping <laughs> between different topics and I'm going to jump into something else right now by what you said, because you said, you know, what you're looking, you're looking for people, you know, people that are working symbiotically. Mm -hmm. And you, we, the last time we spoke, we were talking about um, remote work. We talked about, oh, yes. I, I mentioned yeah. the Malcolm Gladwell, New York Post thing that mm -hmm. he said, mm -hmm. remote work is detrimental, something about <laughs> what have you done to yourself, something to that yep. extent, blah, blah, blah. Yep. How do you build that cohesion in a company when you're completely remote and full disclosure for those that don't know me i've been completely remote now for quite some time so um i'm a slightly biased but like how do you do that like if you are investing in a company or starting your own company which you've done as well how do you build that cohesion so that everyone is a well-oiled machine yeah so uh completely transparency on my side for the last uh you know basically 10 years of my career i've never worked inside of an office before and i've never worked in anything other than a remote distributed team so i've, I've never even had an employee who's sitting next to me or in the same city i think now that i maybe in the same city but like not not in the not a next door neighbor not someone i met up with every day i yeah i've, I've always worked in pretty much a work from home remote work environment but at every single gig and everything that i've ever started and i think that the key to cohesion, I, you know, people discovered it rather late, but I'm, I'm proud to say that I've had teams that I used to work with, you know, internationally, and we'd all, you know, like get on Minecraft together after like, after the work hours are done, right? Like it, nowadays it's like Fortnite and, and Grand Theft Auto or whatever people are getting on. But I remember back then getting on, getting, having my team, not like mandating it, but like spread, like I spread the seeds of that a little bit, right? Like, Hey, anyone here play Minecraft? And it developed into playing like, Minecraft, or we'd watch, um, we'd go on one of those websites where we can all like watch movies together, TV together, or something too. And we did these really goofy things. I remember some of the um, earlier, pro like both companies that I had worked for or started. I remember those, those like, those seeds that really sprouted during COVID where everyone was doing happy hours and game nights. Those are things I've actually been doing for years. And a lot of it came down to, you know, there was a, um, a few companies I worked for that really mastered 
it's called like i guess the art of asynchronous like communication which you know that includes a mixture of like loom slack Miro, like using, you know, whiteboarding technology, having the proper breadcrumbs, you know, not just like, not just statically working in a Word doc and working in Excel, but actually be finding ways to like leave a daily stand up, all those kind of things were, were very fluid. And it wasn't, it wasn't like you needed to be on a call 24 seven. There were a lot of companies that, again, I both worked for and I had taken inspiration and, and used for my own companies where there was a sense of like, there was a sense of that the, the cogs and the wheels kept churning but we didn't need to be like on the phone 24 seven. There didn't need to be anyone burning out, trying to write big essays on what they did per day. Just be, you know, simple, like, you know, something would ping you in Slack, you'd add your stand up per day, or you'd, you'd have submitted on a website or something. And there you go. Right. And maybe you'd record a video to come with that as well. And, and those, the, the power of understanding how a full team, not just like the founders, but how a full team can get in the rhythm of, you know, using videos, using, their voice using um, even oh one company was heavy into voice messages that I worked with actually and that I I and then honestly like I took inspiration from them and gave it to a lot of companies that I advise for and they love it right because even with video you know these days we don't all love being on video all the time and you know we even with Zoom like same thing with async though right you might feel like you're not really quite prepped for that so like screw it if you can do it in a voice message or if you can have the voice only thing in Loom like even those things have become healthy. I think, you know, a small secret too is like offsites are very useful. You know, a lot of the companies I worked for back then, I'd at least fly once or twice, you know, during my time with them, uh, or I guess like a year per year to, you know, work out of their office, work with them. Like those were all important parts of the like, you know, process as well. But uh, yeah, I think, I think people have remote work kind of wrong sometimes where they're like, oh, it's such an extreme on either side. I think there's ways to build balance and ways to, understand like and I'll, and also I'll admit I've been working I may have not worked out of an office of a company but I've been working out of WeWorks forever right WeWorks co-working spaces coffee shops like I'm not sitting at home all it's work from home in the sense of like I can go home at any time and we'll keep working from there right but you know if I want to go to like the library and work there instead right and take some calls in the conference room there like that's that's something that's been uh, always open and it's it's also I will admit for those out there that are interested in remote work or trying to understand it better. Like it's, it's healthy to move around too. It's still good to do, but you know, having the flexibility to be remote and working from wherever more than anything. It's it's great. It's great. Yeah. It's, it's just the irony of that post by Malcolm Gladwell, because, (laughs) you know, I I don't remember, I I think it was, yeah, it was the marketing against the grain podcast, which if you don't listen to it, you guys should check it out where they basically pointed out that he had outlined his entire routine in a day, how he starts working. And it yeah. was basically yeah. going to a coffee shop or his favorite espresso or latte or whatever, and doing all these things that required him to not be in an office. Um, right. And he's also a author, which he can write from anywhere. He does not yeah. sit in an office. Right. Um, so it's just one Such of those things article. that is the, the irony of like what yeah. he's saying compared to what he does. Mm-hmm. So do mm-hmm. what I say, not what I do. And, I'm just like, it's, you know, I, I understand that I have the privilege to be able to work from home and not a lot of people have that privilege. Yeah, very true. Um, but still, I, if I feel that if most companies were to allow it, I think it's something that would be beneficial to them. They would see a better quality of life. Their employees mm-hmm. would perform better because they're Definitely. overall happier, get more rest. They don't have to wake up early to commute in or yep. whatever the situation may be. So, yeah, I, I, I definitely recommend it mm-hmm. but all right so let's go back to the startup world sure what sure. has been your favorite and you don't have to give names but what has been mm-hmm. your favorite role or situation in a startup to sort of get involved in where you knew like a this is going to be big or b yeah. i just want to like this is going to be fun <laughs> so. yeah admittedly um i've had a few recent startups i've advised for in the web3 space that are are they're again they're a little bit slowed down by the what's going on right now but i know they're going to do well once things pass over or once they once they sort of like give it a little more time to um for people to regain confidence so definitely definitely in web3 i've been very excited but actually i'll even go as far as saying that the ai space has been very exciting for me in recent years i myself work for some ai companies i'm running an ai shop now but you know, I, I love, you know, in that space, there's people who are building just incredibly intelligent type of technology, right? Especially in, I've worked with like companies that are doing stuff in like digital humans or in natural language processing, which that's getting really impressive, right? I don't know if you've seen, yeah. Gabe, all the, uh, all the cool AI art that people yeah. have been yeah, messing with lately, but yeah, 
when people can turn that into a business function, right. And, and do things that are like for sales, for marketing, for whatever have you, right. Design like AI that designs websites for you and stuff. Like we're getting into some very impressive territory that I think like the humans will always need help, like with that decision-making and some ways that it can go, but it just like just saving time, automating different things like that are usually mundane and, and very hard to set up or just, just take too much time for, for people that doesn't need to be spent. Like those are companies that get me really excited. And I think even in what, what I'm liking, I'm going to extend it even farther. What I'm loving is, you know, I'm talking about sort of enterprise B2B use cases here, but taking a step further, consumer companies that, and a few that I have worked with that are using like, you know, in some way or another, they might be doing something with like, you know, map based stuff. Right. I've seen, I've know some companies that have taken after like the Pokemon go model and trying to create local experiences or, um, there's other companies that I know are doing stuff like with different like social media competitor, or new ways of doing social media that are using AI to curate, personalize. Like they're building, they're building, you know, the new sort of Facebooks or Twitters with with AI and innovative sort of intelligent technology at the forefront, rather than you know building yeah. something that's very simple and feed based and then going at it later. I know people have different opinions on like AI being worried about AI and automation, yeah. but I think the idea of either in the consumer startup side or the B two B startup side. The idea of AI, you know, being a, a supporting force and something that can sort of be, you know, be an a, a assisting force rather than something that pushes against you or takes over your job. Like, with the, there's a lot of startups that are building with that mentality in mind of creating yeah. that kind of supportive AI, and that gets me really excited. So I was just and I was summarizing it at the end too that like Web three and AI are sort of my like top focuses. I'll say I also love what's going on in like and you know I don't get to work with as many companies in this space, but virtual reality and augmented reality for sure yeah. get me very excited too and a half for a while. I think the development there has just slowed down a lot. I think metaverse is bringing some of those concepts back, but um, you know, I'm still trying to like, I just don't have as many like, you know, advising experiences in those things. For me, it's a lot more of still yeah. just like classic, you know, B2B and, and uh, consumer side stuff. Yeah. It, it's actually, it's quite funny. Um, to think, you know, just to jump back into the AI and Terminator taking over the world bit mm -hmm. where, you know, there's, there's, there's a few books that I've read nine ways to future proof your future is one. By, oh, sure. Um, our, oh my God, Robert Riley, Michael Riley. Oh crap. Yeah. I've, I've heard, I've heard of it. I don't remember who wrote it, but I've heard of that. It's one. a really, sure. it's a really good book. And he basically, you know, pointed out like, listen, we've been saying this since the fifties, you know, and what happens is for the, for the people that don't know what's going to happen is what always happens yes certain jobs will disappear and then other jobs will be born because you know let's be realistic i really believe in we, that we didn't have a youtube creator career you know until a few years ago now you got guys like marquise brownlee i'm kbhd that you know that's what he is that's what he does you know me i'm not that i still have a full-time job but <laughs> it's you know these guys are, are making millions of dollars based off of their YouTube career or their TikTok careers or, you know, whatever it is. So, and I'm not saying that that was their goal, but that's, there's always going to be something to come up. There will be certain jobs that will be automated. That's just facts of life. That's what happens. Businesses are always looking to be more efficient, always looking to save wherever they can so that they can maximize profits. Right. That's sort of what businesses do. <laughs> it's just, par for the course that that is what a business tend to do that's why certain people like they haggle you over your salary no we don't want to raise minimum wage because we don't want to pay you certain much because we want to keep more of the profit it sucks because when the cost of living has gone up it really doesn't help you to not get that extra bump we get that now these tools are here are to make your job easier because certain tools, if we're still making cars the way we were making them in the 40s and 50s, we would have a lot of people with a lot of hurt backs. Exactly. It's, just, it's you know, I, I've heard the argument, well, that's not the truth. That's not the case because people would work out more so that they can be in shape. I'm like, you don't have any way of knowing that. <laughs> we have no way of knowing that. People, um, yeah. I like the idea of being a futurist a little bit more than trying to justify the past. You know what I mean? I think I, it's, exactly. I mean, yeah. you know, there's a, you know, time moves forward. Time doesn't move backward. Like let's not stay there. Let's, let's move forward with every aspect of life. But, you know, you, you brought up a point earlier. You, you mentioned this, albeit briefly that you're still up on web threes, even though like right now the market on cryptos and 
you know, basically tech in general is very down on um, well, the markets period, regardless of what, you know, vertical you're in. But what, how do you advise a startup or someone looking to get start a business in this time or somebody who has been in business, but is seeing a real, you know, a downturn at this particular moment, because obviously this is, these are crazy times with the inflation rate being what it is and the interest rate rising. Yes. The fed may lower it to sort of tamper it down or keep rising. I don't remember right now where we're at. I keep, I keep going back and forth. And Raised by day. <laughs> yeah. Like, how do you advise someone that's freaking out? That is like, oh crap, Nikia. What do, what do I do? What do I do? I need to I need to shut business down. I need to fire everybody. It's like, yeah, yeah. What do I? You know, like, how, what's your advice? Certainly, scary times. I'm not I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to yeah. be a uh, a startup, whatever. Not not an optimist, but just someone who like does like ignorant. I'm not going to be ignorant to the fact that you know these things are going on. But I will say that you know, as of right now, I know a lot of you know, companies that are moving into raising their series A round if they were in seed. So there's still, and there's still a lot of investors that are clamoring. So if, you, if you've been able to find product market fit and prove your traction, like you're not, you know, in a terrible place or anything like that. I just want to kick off with that. I think right now those companies are doing pretty good. If you're in seed or pre-seed sort of area, I think there's also a good, you know, it's, it's good to remember that, uh, you know, outside of the traditional path of just like finding a VC and going with a firm and having like a couple of firms raise your round, there's the opportunity. I think angel invest, I'm still hearing, you know, a lot of angel investors open to funding right now. So that's pretty good. That's a, the one alternative. Crowdfunding seems to be pretty strong on um, Republic or uh, some of those other like websites. I'm, I'm blanking yeah. on what they're called right now. Well, even like Kickstarter, right? But more yeah. for physical stuff for D to C. Those things are still like seeing results and people are still pretty happy with what's going on. And then also accelerators and incubators, right? Like there's other you know, rather than going to pitch, you know, try to pitch a hundred VCs in a week, why not go to an accelerator, hang out there for six months, you know, get a little funding, then get in, right in front of like the investors that you might want. Right. So, and I've seen a lot of, there's, there's not really a lot of accelerators that I know that are like cutting their program off right now. Like they're still doing a winter 2022 cohort or a spring 2023 cohort tech stars, you know, uh, generator, like all these cool, all these cool firms are, are still going and, and offering that. So Y Combinator, right? So, you know, it's there's. I do understand that it's it's not. It's easier said than done to get and have access to those alternative al alternative sources. But I will clarify that I think there's a lot of people who get into the startup world and panic, like, oh, if I don't know a VC, it's too late for me. There's definitely other ways to raise funding. There's other ways to stay afloat. You know, I think to tackle one of the parts that you mentioned, which is a very genuine concern. It's like I need to fire all my employees, or I need to, you know change everything right like there's there's definitely a lot of questions around that but i will say that you know by by being open to you know maybe as a founder yourself like taking cuts i know that's hard to hear or finding or finding again or being open to finding those alternative sources to try to stay afloat um optimizing cash flow like there's there's a lot of different ways you could do it to you know and i think I think I think startups will do okay. Like even just to comfort everyone, like I think there is going to be a lot of people who can survive the winter. There might there might be people who won't. But you know the reality is if you're if you're looking at the right things, if you're managing you know the budget sort of properly, hiring freezes are certainly fine too. And considering those and, and not or you know maybe finding ways to you know have like maybe co some people that are part time or contract efforts rather than full timers just to try to like sustain for a bit. Like those are those are not bad opportunities as well. I still. I will say one thing that I've recommended startups really do not do, and some do it out of like necessity or just out of advice, but hiring an agency right now or hiring a big team to you know build a, to put a hundred thousand dollars into your MVP or something like that, or that or that they'll make you spend a hundred thousand dollars MVP, yeah. not something I'd recommend. Right, I would recommend you find better ways to build out earlier versions of your product. I'd find ways to optimize how you're building and spending on servers. Those are things that now more than ever make more sense rather than haphazardly kind of setting things up, getting things spun up and then just like, you know, later realizing, oh shoot, we spent way too much up front. Finding ways to lower that cost will help you keep your teams and help you keep who you need. So yeah, it's those are those are just a few pieces of advice. But you know, even even with what's going on with Web3, I still think a lot of the Web3 downturn is in like the crypto and like NFT side more than it is even like like, I think people are, are way too, you know, doomsday on like, oh, all of Web3 is done for because there's a lot of very successful, you know, more infrastructure based companies or, or companies that are building tools or utilities 
to help with like um, minting NFT. Like there's still a lot of like platforms that are, are doing just fine and are hiring and, and whatnot. There are the bigger players in the space who are, are admittedly more web two, which are firing yeah. and or hiring, free, like freezing hiring in the space as well. So, you know, sort of, it's almost like do a little bit of your research, right? Even if you're like in the yeah. web3 space and, and see that you're, there are competitors that are coming up. There are other people that are coming up and sure the, the funding might slow down a little bit, but it, it's not necessarily stopped. So people should continue to resume and, and look into those alternative sources as well. Yeah. I, I think that's sort of, that's very important <laughs> advice and feedback for people to know, because I know that there are a lot of people that sort of like, Oh no, what's going to happen? What's going on? Am I going to be yeah. like, you know, this is like falling through the cracks before it's had a yeah. chance to take off. And yeah, if you have that sort of defeatist attitude, then yes, it's going to sort of be that way. And I'm yeah. not saying that you shouldn't be on, on alert or, you know, sure. Sure. Cause I think being on alert or be having a slight level of anxiety is good for any mm -hmm. sort of business leader founder because okay. it sort of keeps you on your toes, keeps you looking and researching and trying to see what's the latest, who's on your heels that, yeah. you know, is maybe better than you or, or not saying it's a competition because you should always mm -hmm. just focus on what you need to do. But it's always good to sort of know what's going on in the industry that yeah. you're trying to get in. Cool, cool. Let's talk about you now. Yeah. And let's talk about, <laughs> you know, why startups? Like, let's, I mean, why business yeah. in general like what made you say hey i really like this as opposed to you know what i want to go work at goldman sachs or i want to go <laughs> i don't know whatever anywhere <laughs> well it, it, admittedly there was a there was a part of the story i used to not share as much but i've become more more comfortable sharing it now so i'll, I'll briefly run through it but you know, uh, longer than even 10 years ago, but uh, a while ago, I was a cancer survivor, actually. And I, uh, you know, came out of, uh, I was, I was quite young then, but it was still enough to really like, even when you're young, like those kind of things shake you up, right? And, and there was always a uh, feeling as I, as I grew older of, um, and went into things like, you know, high school and, and college age, where I realized that, hey, you know, there's, there's really more than just taking the traditional route to do something, right? If you want to make, and, and coming out of, you know, being a survivor in that realm, like I always thought, how can I bring change? How can I give back to communities? How can I how can I do more than just the traditional right like route, right? And so for me, it was always a and initially I wanted to get into the medical field, but then realized how much school would be involved. So I went more for business. And I I think, yeah, it's 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 like pretty crazy, right? Like I remember I was like really considering, you know, becoming a doctor. And then I'm like, you know, this just there's gotta be another way. And innovation that makes was perfect really sense. The, yeah, no, no, it, it's, 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 it's crazy. But I remember I was in like, gosh, it was like a super, super long time ago. But in like middle school, I had this one class that taught me how to build websites and taught me how to code just to like help with like math skills. It was a really crazy thing back then. I, I think now it's become a lot more common, but you know, this was, was quite some time ago. And so having that experience, being able to see like, wow, these like building technology for good or, you know, for for the betterment of society, that's that's a way to give back, right? That's a way to do things and, and break the you know status quo, you know, do things outside the mold, think outside the box. And all of that, all of that hunger to be sort of a, a self-starter who can make an impact somewhere, anywhere, really drew me to startups and technology, right? I just you hear the stories of, you know, I would I would say even like these days, the visionaries were always interesting, right? Jobs, but Wozniak was just as interesting, you know, being kind of in the background, right? And and giving like you know, whatever it was, like $3 million to each of the uh, partners that were originally were screwed over by Apple, right? Like there's all these amazing, and now he runs all these like very impact focused, education focused things. And over the years, I've definitely given time to um, help with, you know, startups that, uh, or even just nonprofits that work in tech or teach STEM to schools or, uh, or bring STEM to, you know, different countries and stuff. Like there's bringing code to the world, right? Democratizing coding education. All those things are, I think, real ways that the next generation can bring an impact. And, you know, I'm, I'm still pretty young myself, but, you know, just growing up, like I always kept that ethos and I always sort of was drawn to companies where passion was rewarded more than just being an employee, right? Where you're not a number, but you really are someone who's going to bring change as a manager, bring change as a designer. And because you love the industry that you might be in or that your this company might be servicing. And yeah, I just found my happy place, like being a part of that initially as a, as a front end web developer, I'm becoming now someone who does product development and, and heads teams, heads operations. But yeah, I've, I've never really lost. I've never really lost track of what that means. And I guess it, it evolves all the time. But yeah, like I said, there was this 
this part of the story I didn't quite share all the time, but I think yeah, yeah. now more than ever, you know, I think it's 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 not a bad thing to share because everyone is going through their own struggles and and I want Absolutely. that to hopefully turn into starting a successful venture or taking, you know, downturns in their life and turning them into into gold, right? It's it's possible. It's hard, but it's possible. So well, yeah. have sorry to sound like a motivational speaker for a second. Not at all, man. Not at all. Everyone <laughs> yeah. has an origin story and some people's origin yeah. stories are very motivational. So perfect. Thank you for sharing that. Of course. Um, of course. So, you know, let's work now. Let's pivot into chat mode because, you know, like what yep. you said, you're a people leader, you're an operations leader, you, you, you're a business starter. So let's yep. talk about chat mode. What are you hoping to talk to accomplish with chat? If you can, I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you know, yep. how, whatever you're comfortable sharing about chat mode, what, what are you hoping to accomplish with chat mode? What is the, the goal and, and purpose of chat mode? Yeah, you know, I think I think outside of being a a consultancy and an agency, I think I love I just I love seeing the reaction on people's faces when they see the power of automation, right? And the power of you know automation turns into AI, and AI turns into something that can make decisions for you at some capacity. You know, with, with enterprise and big corporations, there's a level to there's a limit to where that can go, but the idea is that you know with the right type of technology, the right type of stakeholders and developing the right education within these companies. We talked about a little bit earlier, right? Re recrafting what it means to have a chatbot or voice assistant help you out at work or having an AI tool that runs and does tasks for you and, and saves, you know, days of your time uh, is is something that I think, you know, people I want to see the people see the value in that, especially in enterprise spaces. And I'm honestly, I think that bringing in innovative technology to more legacy companies or, or older companies or pe- the companies have been doing things the same way for a while, bringing that new technology into them can change the very culture, right? Of, of what's expected from the employees. It can change, you know, how, how happy people are at work, how, how interested they are in what kind of work they do because of the tools that they're using to accomplish the work, right? It's not just, it's not just classic, but some of our clients, it's not just classic Excel sheets, right? There's actually very cool ways you can, you can generate data, have portals, have analytics that show that actually show how the AI is working and the kind of impact that it's making, right? Which is which is insane to me, right? That's there's real there's now there are real ways to even track and show the ROI because of the maturity that we've gone to with the technology and how quickly it can start working, right? Out out of the gate with all the different automation tools, AI libraries, everything that's available out there. And me and my team love putting those things together and, and really showing how that can work. We've done some stuff even like in computer vision in the past, right? Which um, you know even has a lot of uh, it's it, you know, that's right now everyone hears that and thinks self-driving cars, but I'm, I'm telling you, it'll be worth more than, it'll be worth for more industries than just that too. There'll be other places that we'll see that make a great impact. And yeah, you know, I just, I love, again, I, I'm a very impact per, like driven person and I try to share the passion. I try to share the excitement, the evangelism with um, everybody that I work with, even the startups that I'm with, right? I, I, my advisory sessions are always full of energy and I keep it that way because, um, you know, even when these downturns happen, even when these when when technology has you know certain limits that you might run into, being able to push through and really see the value of pushing through and pushing it to the edge sometimes at a, again at a safe distance, not not trying to destroy anything or delete tons of data, but you know keeping it safe enough that it it can process data more in a more interesting way or save you time. Yeah, these are things that I just I keep I hold very core, and not losing sight of that philosophy is something that I think, or rather letting that philosophy adapt also with the technology they're using and everything, but. I've, I've seen that philosophy, you know, do wonders and, and sort of keep to the mission of what we do at chat mode. So, yeah. Yeah. This has been amazing. I, I don't want to take yeah. up much of your time. I'm truly grateful for the time that you shared. I can see the passion in <laughs> when you're talking and I'm hoping that everyone else Appreciate can see it, yeah. that. Um, this is exciting. If you want, I, I'm going to put everything obviously in the show notes, but do you want to let people know where, how they can reach you, how they can mm-hmm. more about you? Go ahead. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm on um, Twitter at Nick at Nick Vimal, N-I-K-V-I-M-A-L. So that's probably where I'm the most active. Um, I do a lot of Twitter spaces. I do a lot of like community interaction. Um, I've been working a little bit on personal projects as well. So I'm doing like event series. I, I'm here in the Twin Cities, actually, in Minneapolis, and I'm doing a lot of stuff out here. i um, just been trying to you know spread, just trying to spread myself a little bit across, especially after COVID. Like it was really hard being behind the screen all the time, but now I'm trying to get into more in-person stuff. I'm trying to get into, you know, I'm, I, I just, for people to know if they, what, you know, if they want to reach out to me, like I'm very much involved with, again, like consumer B2B web three 
And uh, even even dipping my toes into like the content creator space, I actually happen to manage a EDM artist as well as one of my as one of my projects. So um, yeah, there's like a lot of different things that I do, and I try to keep I try to stay busy, but I'm always open to talking to things, you know, innovation and interesting, new, funky, fresh, all that all that fun stuff. So thank you so much, Nikhil. It's been a pleasure. I can't wait for everybody to hear this episode, and yeah. you know, thank you again. I, I'm. Of course. Thanks for having me, Gabe. Yeah, yeah. my pleasure.